well after six, let's call our meeting to order. So, okay, Water District Board. Um, roll call shows all directors are present. There is no public hearing. There are two items on the consent agenda. Anyone wish to take anything off? I just have a minor spelling correction on the minutes, so I guess so. Okay. That's all it is. All right. Well, then I'll move for approval for 3.2. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. This Opposed? Thing is normally over here. I think that's unanimous. Okay. Bookmarks. Sorry, but on, on the minutes, um, on page seven of the entire agenda, um, under reports, what did I do? item five, it just says the water reuse conference, it should be begins. No, begins. That's all. Okay. okay. With that, I'll move approval. I will second. <laughs> all in favor? Yes, Aye. 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 Okay. That's gone. Take too long. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Not too bad. So next is oral communication. This is time for anyone in the audience to address us on any item not on tonight's agenda. Welcome back from the baseball trip. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, spring training was wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. I wish the results so far this season matched what I saw in spring training, but that's okay. Um, I'm Scott McGilvery. I represent a group called Water for Santa Cruz County. And at your last meeting, um, Miranda Sala gave a presentation about what we found in the brochure regarding how much more water there is in Santa Cruz that could be directed here through water transfers. And there was a question, I think it was Ms. Lather that had a question about uh, the numbers and whether what year they came from and the numbers that were in that report, the 211 million gallons between January and May is 2017 water. And um, Rosemary Menard commented that that was an extremely wet year, which is true. So I looked at the records for 2016 and applying the same factors, 1.4 million gallons a day, limited by the amount of water taken from the North Coast. And in uh, 2016, the number of gallons that could have come here is 211 million gallons, exactly the same. So even in an average rainfall year, the constraint is only the capacity to transfer water. The North Coast water is abundant. And in another minute, I'd just like to sort of expand on that idea because I think there's some numbers that you're not uh, well aware of because you don't think about Santa Cruz much, but there are the key numbers. Uh, the first number is um, 730 million gallons. That's the amount of water that the North Coast supplied Santa Cruz in 2017. Uh, the next number I'd like to offer is 598 million. That was 2016. And there's a third number, and that's 671 million gallons. That's Santa Cruz projections for the next 30 years coming from the North Coast. So some number, 650 plus or minus, is, is what's available and in play. There's only one other number. That's one minute to go? Yep. One minute. Only one other number that needs to be kept in mind because the North Coast water is presently used by Santa Cruz. So if it comes here, what do they do? Well, they have a water source called the winter water in the San Lorenzo River. They have 900 million gallons a year they're entitled to. And the average over the last 18 years is 50 million gallons. So there's 850 million that they have that they can backfill the water that could come here. I think those numbers are important and give you an order of magnitude of what we could do if we can get it together. So again, thank you very much for the opportunities to bring this forward and uh, we look forward to giving more information. Good, thank you. Any other questions? No, I just say that, I mean, I think it's good that you're, you know, trying to find an answer and I appreciate that. And just, um, you just have to work with the city and have the city present us with something. Yes, sir. Has to come through them. It's their water. <laughs> Our pass. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else wish to address us? Good okay. evening, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. And I um, also want to thank you for um, listening to the water for Santa Cruz County and Mr. McGilvray. Um, and I would like to encourage your board to uh, discuss with Santa Cruz City Water the idea of increasing the size of the inner tie connection with your district so that um, 
water from North Coast could come in greater volumes and go the other way if they needed it. But I think I see that as a bottleneck, really, and, and that if, um, if the North Coast water were to be used to help s alleviate the seawater intrusion, having a larger intertie connection could be of great value. Thank you, and um, I, I did want to, in terms of the, um, the minutes from last time, I'm sorry I'm late, but um, I, I do have a question for staff that I'll ask at another time about the exceptions uh, for the Aptos Village project that were mimicked f uh, or also extended to the uh, Rancho Del Mar Center in that there's no monthly charge on master meters. And um, I have some questions about capacity charges on the submeters, but I'll talk with staff afterwards. And okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address us? Seeing no one. Any director comments? Doesn't look like it. Anyone? Anyone? Wait. Uh, are we going to use this to discuss the water reuse conference, or is that already? That's another. Yeah, that's item. another item on there. It's okay. Uh, I think there is, isn't it? Yep, yes. There is. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do that then. Okay. Sounds like we're just moving on then. Reports 5.1, the board planning calendar, please. <coughs> yeah, a couple of things to report out. There are three standing committee meetings next week. That's Monday is finance. Um, and then uh, Tuesday's public outreach. Uh, Director LeHue will be gone, so Director uh, Lather's filling in. And then Wednesday is infrastructure and supply. Um, so just try to make everybody aware of that. We got to line up on one, two, three, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and then also on May 1st, uh, we will have a budget workshop starting at 5 p.m. So hour early, um, probably okay. bring food in for that okay. session. That's all. Okay, got that written down. So let's see, the report out on the water reuse conference, oral. So Carla, you want to start? Oh, okay. Well, uh, this is the third time I've been to that water reuse co conference. It is a scientific and technical conference primarily, uh, not uh, political or, you know, the legal things. And it, so I, the overall impression I had, like, over that first, is that it was uh, really amazing how much progress has been made. It's just been accelerating over the years of what these scientists have been able to report on uh, improving recycled water projects. It's uh, very encouraging in terms of uh, research on CECs and how to eliminate them from water supply and, uh, you know, a lot of other problem chemicals that are part of our consumer waste <coughs> load that goes into our groundwater also. And so I really did uh, appreciate that. Uh, there are a couple of uh, there was one, uh, the panel, I attended a health, health issues panel mm -hmm. that John Ricker, our John Ricker from the health department, the county health department participated in. And uh, I got, uh, I think there's a room I, for uh, customer citizen activism on reducing the uh, load of chemicals that go into the waste stream period. That would simplify everybody's including the cities and their water treatment program and cap and SoCal's, you know, groundwater issues. These chemicals could, if we reduce the load, it would make it a lot easier and people would be a lot less worried about their, uh, the water that they're drinking. So anyway, that's the, there was a lot of, there was a lot. I was very tired when I got back, but it was very good, very good uh, conference. Anything, Mr. Jeffy? Yes. <clears throat> so this was my first conference since I've been on the board. And uh, the reason I went was because we're evaluating water reuse. And I wanted to take the opportunity to talk with the experts on uh, health issues associated with water reuse. And I was uh, looking for um, 
issues and I was not able to find any at all, really. It, I think we're, we benefit from the fact that this has been going on for decades and um, they've, you know, they've, it's improved over the decades, the, the uh, purification of the water. I think the, 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 um, the plants now have redundancy in, in monitoring. So if, if, if systems are out, they quickly can tell that they're out. And then there's, uh, unless the water is going directly into a well right by the plant, if there's any, any travel time whatsoever, even if there was something that was detected, they could stop the water before it's recharged. So um, it, there, were, there were a lot of talks that were not uh, um, directly applicable to our district. Um, there were talks on direct potable reuse instead of indirect reuse where you recharge the aquifer. And um, <clears throat> I, I, I guess one thing that I would was new to me was that even though there aren't guidelines for direct potable re reuse, on a case-by-case -case basis, they are approving it in the state now. So overall, it was a good experience. I agree it was a tiring experience. Had to, uh, there were concurrent sessions and oftentimes there were, there were talks in, in more than one session that I wanted to go to, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm glad I went. Well, you think? I mean, I, I, one of the things I wanted to find out about was the redundancy issue and what happens if, you know, how is how are any potential problems detected, and if so, how quickly can those can the system be stopped and so forth? And I, I felt pretty good. I got I got a lot of good information on that. That was my focus. For sure. Because I'm an engineer and I've been to a lot of con conferences in my career regarding the engineering aspects, I decided to focus on the public outreach part because as an engineer, I realized that maybe I'm a little inept on that and I could get some like, good ideas. And it was amazing what other agencies have done. I've taken. I heard there was a trailer being shown uh, down there. There was a trailer <laughs> being shown and there was a lot of talk about it. <laughs> there was a great deal of interest in that, but um, it was very helpful to understand maybe um, how I can express myself a little bit differently and get the message out better. I wanted to talk about three things that I experienced. Uh, there was a talk on CECs. Uh, it was the last, it was scheduled for the last time slot and the last day. And they mentioned that how things have changed in the last three years, because back then it would be the first session of the conference <coughs> and it would be always highly, I mean, they'd fill up the room with people and now it was the last and it was fairly lightly attended. And uh, even like one or two of the talks weren't even about CECs, they just stuck them in there because they had no other place. So things have really settled down with that. I think they really think they understand it. They know how to monitor it and how to deal with it. And I think that's, that's good news. Um, there were some talks on a new technique. Uh, as you know, the, the ones that we look at here in California they use reverse osmosis. And there's some that are going on on the East Coast um, which use ozone and, and filtering to, to do the same sort of things. And, and they're getting similar kind of water, water quality out the back end. So um, it's, uh, and it's about half the cost because you know, the equipment is less and the, and the operations cost is less. And so that's really taking off on the East Coast and, and even overseas some. And so that's good to see that there are alternatives and they're being investigated and, and pushed forward. It was, it was mentioned that here in California that would be a tough slog because you know, that's not the thing that our regulators are familiar with now. And so the first one out the gate would have to really, really prove that it really, 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 really does work and produces an equivalent to quality. Um, there was also a talk about stormwater. And of course they were talking about you know, to save money, they put the stormwater, kind of like Monterey is doing, they put the stormwater through the, uh, the purification process. And uh, so they were doing that. And so that was good to see that not just Monterey, but others are doing the same thing. Uh, so that was good. 
And uh, all in all, it was pretty pretty good conference, I thought. I would like to add one thing sure. uh, from that same talk. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. And one of the processes that they were had tested uh, was uh, expanding the secondary treatment for a longer period of time, so that it would break down more of the products that they were that were considered problematic, the CECs and uh, larger compounds like ibuprofen and things like that that f were still trapped in the water. And they found out that it was a much uh, it eased the pressure on the RO membranes and the the recycling uh, the purification process in general to expand the secondary treatment time and I think that would might even be possible to even try test that out in Santa Cruz uh, but the results are very promising and and it had a net cost benefit also mm -hmm. and also more efficiency too so yeah, so that j was just one of those new things, and it was not possible to do that study here. They did it in Florida, I believe. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Okay. All right, so we move on now. Administrative business, uh, conditional and unconditional will circulars, 6.1. Yeah, Taj will take a lead on this, and um, Shelley can uh, support him if necessary. Hi, good evening. We've got one um, application under the old uh, WDO program as well as one under the new. And so 6.1.1 is uh, has completed their offsets according to the new uh, offset program and they have committed to uh, go green, uh, basically all the go green reductions. And the second one is a single family house with a accessory dwelling unit and that, of course, uh, at the old program doesn't require them. This is a conditional well served letter at this stage, a renewal. Any questions? I, I have a dumb question. Uh, <laughs> like, how do do we verify when they do a deed, a deed reduction in irrigation? Is it verified later, or how do you tell? It's recorded. We, we we get a copy of the deed. Uh, but uh, what about compliance, though? Um, I think at this stage we don't have an official program to monitor and check up on that, oh, but it is. We're, we're working on that though, um, compiling a database of the properties that have done deed restrictions, and at some point we will go back and check. But we haven't done that yet. Okay. Yeah, it was just that was the main thing because that it does result in a significant savings in uh, water, water fees, so. Anyone in the public wish to speak on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I've had the same question as Director Christensen about verification of these things and long-term verification uh, that, that they will be adhered to for the long-term water savings of the, of the district and effect on the aquifer. I also have a question about um, what's being done with the um, uh, $55,000 per acre foot that's collected from these properties. I, I remember that it was to go to uh, conservation projects that would not have happened otherwise. And I'm wondering what is the district exactly doing with this money that's coming in? That's the stormwater program. The stormwater program. We've, we've actually spent some of the money too on some of the projects that the board has approved to date. So the NODES machine was yep, one of right, the mm -hmm, recipients right. of the funding. Mm -hmm. uh, we did the school fixture retrofits, mm -hmm. and yeah, now we're looking at stormwater recharge, and we have some other ideas too for some projects. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and with the stormwater recharge project, that will be um, quantifiable and measurable. Um, to, to make sure that it is doing what it's designed That's to what do. What we're working on is evaluating that mm -hmm. right now, so it's not a for certain thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm still against adding more demand on an overtaxed aquifer with seawater intrusion as a problem. So, um, I I really do think you need to enforce your water groundwater emergency <laughs> that you declared. I think it was in 2014 and. Um, and to again consider a moratorium because there is a problem and continuing to add more service connections and water demand is not going to help. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, I'd like to comment. Sure. Please do. So if we did not have a water demand offset that more than offset the amount of new water usage, then there would be a, a taxing of the aquifer as it is. There's not. So that's why I vote for it. And I think that concept is a little foreign, but the, the idea is that if, if a household is going to use 100 gallons per day, they have to come up with a water demand offsets greater than that amount so that there's savings to the aquifer instead of a, a deficit to the aquifer. So. Okay. What's your pleasure? I'll make both motions. I'll second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So, item 6.2, the Consumer Confidence Report. Great. We're going to have Carla present tonight uh, for us. So, Good evening. I'm pleased to bring you the 2017 Consumer Confidence Water Quality Report. This was a, also a joint effort with um, staff from the outreach who did the for formatting and uh, layout design. It's very similar to last year's report. Um, sorry, hang on one second. I lost my, lost my spot. The report contains all of the required language and the water quality summary table on page six and seven, I believe, seven and six and seven. We also have a, a graphic, I just noticed, um, a new graphic that shows the water parts per million, parts per billion, and parts per trillion <laughs> right oh there that, on that page. That was nice. And that was Becca who did that. Um, I think it looks great. It's a, a good visual for um, people to understand the different concentrations. Mm -hmm. And there really wasn't too much that needed to be added this year except for adding in the number of schools that had requested the lead sampling of their drinking water. Mm -hmm. And we had eight schools who requested that sampling, and we have completed that in 2017. Could we put in the results in here? So we are not going to put in results. They don't, they don't mandate us to put in results, and part of the language in the actual permit amendment and the um, and the new um, Assembly Bill 746 was that the schools they they'll disseminate the data to their okay. parents, students, and staff. Okay. Are there any questions about anything specific? About that or the oh whole no, I mean it about that or in the report itself. Okay. I, I didn't know if, uh, visually is there any way to make the print darker <laughs> on the actual I don't know if it's better on a printed copy but so I, I, I have thought a it was kind of gray instead of black you know I have a printed copy here and it does okay. come out very dark so okay. it could have just been the way the PDF was okay generated came out I just want to make sure people can see it okay came out dark on mine too oh see how it's coming I know yeah oh. mine is mm -hmm. fine that was all. Content-wise, it's good. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I thought it was good work as always. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank um, you. Do uh, do you have more? Uh, do we have a pathogen report in the source water? Do you report that? So we don't. Are you talking bacteriological pathogens? So the only thing that we do on source water is um, check for quarterly for coliform bacteria, total coliform, and um, if, so we have not had any positives on our source water. Um, I don't know what other kind of pathogens you're That's thinking of, but. No, one of the things that came up in the water reuse conference was the GR, that they were looking for the effectiveness of uh, the, re the, re the purification process on on larger sized pathogens. Like, uh, okay, so so we're groundwater only, and so and we don't have any water under the influence of surface water, so we don't test for Giardia or Crypto or any of those um, parasites. Any other questions? Well, I had a few. Um, page twenty-eight, just below the, the 
map of the water districts, I think there's a little bit of language that needs to be changed a bit. It says emergency to share of water supplies. And I think the of is Where not are we? good grammar. It's the third line below the map. Okay. It says emergencies to share of water supplies. Oh. That can be open during. Emergencies to share water supplies would be better grammar. Take out the of. Yeah. Take out the <laughs> of. Got it. Oh, that's it. yeah. That should be gone. Mm -hmm. Thank you for finding that. Sure. And a number of things on page thirty-two. I had some questions about. Um, I see that we've had for nitrate a uh, detection of five point zero, which is half of ten. And I just wondered where that was. What was the circumstance? Uh, so that was expected. That's our country club well and it usually runs about half of the mcl or a little bit below mm -hmm. and this year or last year in 2017 we had uh, a couple instances where it came up right at five okay um All as right. nitrogen as n and uh, down a little bit further radium we have a uh, the mcl is five and we had a 2.6 hit i wonder just where that was and is that expected and so the 2.6 picocuries per liter was at Aptos Junior High, and that was um, part of the initial monitoring that was done when the well was, Aptos Junior High well number two was brought online okay. when we took the first well off. Mm -hmm. And um, the 2.6 was actually a single quarterly sample, and so the average for uh, Aptos Junior High was actually closer to just two. So it was still above the detection limit, but um, the 2.6 was a single sample. Yeah, right. Yeah. Are we still getting sample values in that range, or? No, since the initial monitoring ended, we haven't been prompted to take any further samples. Okay. It's, okay. it's above the detection limit, but below the MCL, so right, the right. state's not concerned. When things get about half of the MCL, I start getting nervous that a little bit of nudge and we could go over it. and. And I would like to know where they are and what the reason is, so for that's why I'm asking. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the next one is iron. There was a 240 hit, and the MCL is 300. So for me, that's pretty close to the MCL. So I wonder where that was and what that was about. So that was from our uh, Madeline well, and that does not have treatment for iron and manganese. And so we know that it usually runs around 150 to 250 sometimes, depending on when it turns on and how much it's been running and this sample could have been taken closer to its startup okay but it's it's still um it's below the mcl it's below the mcl not yes much. it is <laughs> not much um should we be thinking about doing some treatment there i i don't think that that's something I think the 240 was a single sample and it wasn't indicative of needing treatment. I think that it's. And I know that's just a secondary standard, so it's not a. Right. Health risk. I mean. Um, well, continue to look I, at it. Yeah. Well, we we're, I'm taking quarterly samples there. Okay. So we do. Good. We do. We monitor it, how well it's doing. Thank you. A little further down the TDS. Is it? 723. 723. Mm -hmm. That was at Garnet, and um, the conductivity was also high on that sample. Um, conductivity and TDS kind of go together, and so it's just it kind of bumped up a little bit. That is that from chloride there, or you know, I can't remember what the chloride value was at Garnet. If that was the high value for chloride. The chloride value actually was 76, and that was the high value on the range of detection for chloride, 19 to 76. Um, there's, other, there's other constituents in there that also um, impart, you know, total dissolved solids. It's sure, in, of course. I don't think it's just the chloride. Yeah, I'm just so worried about chloride. That's probably our closest well to the ocean, so. Oh, that's understandable. If one were to right. go, th that'd be that one, and if that's starting to happen, it would be good to know about it. We'll, yeah. we'll look into that. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. That's 76. That's yeah, probably okay. And the last one is our TCP number. 
it's gotten up to 11, and the notification level is 5. So that's double the notification level. So I was wondering. So, so I know we've had some hits there, but I'm wondering what do we need to do when we go over the notification level? <coughs> So because the state actually instituted the MCL last year um, at the very end of the year in December, the DDW gave us the choice of keeping 123 TCP in the unregulated constituent monitoring section mm -hmm. with a footnote explaining that, um, that the, the notification level is only, the notification level is only for those constituents that do not have a maximum contaminant level. So we left it as having the notification level and then the MCL as being not applicable. But next but, year. But next year we would change it because now it has an MCL. So we would change it and move it up to um, a primary health standard and it would fall under having an MCL of five. At some point we I'd like to hear about our plan for dealing with the TCP. That's, a, that's an ongoing effort, so. Yeah, you yes. Mm -hmm. Just Country Club well though, right? Country Club well, yes. Mm -hmm. Which we're not using anymore. Yeah, I think. Right. But <coughs> still, if we're, if we're going to use it, we need right, right. Uh, yeah, Country Club was turned off on July 20th last year. But we were looking into a treatment process, I thought. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's. Um, it's. No hurry, but I'd like to hear well, about we're, that. Yeah, that's coming back later. Okay. Uh, but Thank that's you. that effort has been ongoing and pretty much concluded. So. Okay. There are no other questions here. I have. Oh, okay. I have one. Okay. So along the same lines, the chlorate, there's not an MCL, but there's a notification level, and it seems like uh, sometimes we detect above the notification level. Am so, that right. The, the that chlorate was um, in 2013, and th that um, that value of 1,400 parts per billion was actually determined by DDW not to be an actual significance because it had to do with bleach that was sitting for a while and the chlorate level had gone up significantly. So that, and that was taken during the last round of the UCMR, UCMR3. Um, and so it stays in our consumer confidence report because we need to keep it in there, but it's it's not of significance. So the chlorate is that value that you see, that 1,400, um, and that average amount is because if you average that 1,400 with our other sources, it looks like we have that average, but we don't. <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem in 2013 is being corrected? Yes, but they will, they do not want us to take it out of our consumer confidence report. And do, do we have plans to test again? So with the new round right now I'm doing, which is um, collecting for the UCMR4, it's a whole nother sort of collection constituents, of yeah. constituents. Um, once we have that data, and that's, all, that's gonna be this year, 2018, um, our 2018 unregulated constituent monitoring would be put on here, and I believe that we can remove the older UCMR3 data, but I need to confirm that. Okay, good catch. Okay, anyone in the public wish to address us on this item? <coughs> Seeing no one. Okay, what do we do with this? Thank you. I think it's informational, I think. Direct can, staff can, to make changes, if any. And we did. Mm -hmm. So I think we're done with this. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we go to now we go to six point three, board direction on new applicant offset generating project proposal. 5701 SoCal. So in February, we brought you a proposal from Workbench to install the buoy uh, metering systems as a conservation measure and a way for the applicant to meet their offset requirement for their proposed development project. And at that meeting, the board um, directed staff to go back and reevaluate the water savings calculations that we had done. Um, using our own automated meter reading data, if available, 
Um, we also were directed to um, prorate the savings because the buoy device um, has a lifetime of 10 years and our water demand offset program requires savings for 20 years. And you also asked that we, um, we solicit a draft uh, plan from Workbench to collect a pilot study uh, using the buoy device and so we've been um, we started on that effort and then um, as discussed at the last board meeting we've had some new circumstances regarding our automated metering system um, and that's prompted us to evaluate a quicker migration to AMI or advanced metering infrastructure much sooner than we had anticipated. Um, we have an opportunity there financially, I think, to save some money and do it now as well as staff resources. So um, we, we've been talking about that for a while, but uh, we're moving ahead with that evaluation to migrate to AMI. And um, we've gotten the information to Master Meter to do the propagation study and to uh, determine how many collectors we might need, and that'll help us get an idea of the actual cost of implementing AMI now. Um, that's where we are on our evaluation. We've also been checking in with um, some other agencies that have installed Master Meter AMI system. Um, nobody's super far along except for one or two agencies in Texas where they've gotten a full deployment of the system, and in California it's been more of a partial deployment, and. There's no real significant, um, I guess, red flags there from the people that we've talked to, but it is a, you know, a new and evolving technology just like the AMR was when we, we started that process. So the reason why we're bringing this particular issue back tonight is because if we did migrate to AMI, um, the buoy system, the water savings would not happen because they would be happening already through the AMI system. Um, there's a couple exceptions, a couple benefits of buoy that our AMI system wouldn't um, include, and that would be um, the buoy has an automatic or remote shutoff function, and the AMI system does not. Um, the buoy also has a much more robust uh, consumer app that educates people not only how much water they're using and whether they have a leak, but how that water's being used in their home, um, whether it's showers or uh, clothes washing and that sort of thing. So there, there could be a bit of a benefit there, but the main um, leak detection benefit is not gonna provide much more over what the AMI system can provide. And so we wanted to come back and get some direction from the board about whether we should continue um, with the uh, water saving calculation tasks that you've asked us to look into and the pilot study, um, given that we might, we might switch over to AMI and it might be redundant with the buoy. Um, a couple items to note, we're still evaluating whether the buoy product meets the state and federal requirements pertaining to that NSF certification. And um, it's much bigger than lead. It's, it's basically compounds that might be present in certain types of materials like silicones and, and metals and, and that sort of thing. Um, we have heard from Bowie that their individual components that go into the product are all certified, but there's one particular component. Um, it's a Badger meter spud that we stopped using internally several years ago because it's not, it has not been NSF certified. So that's one issue that um, we're still gonna need to get the burden of proof from Bowie that the product does meet the regulatory requirements. Um, if that hurdle can't be cleared, then this is not a viable um, option. And so what we're asking tonight is if you want a, us to continue with the water savings estimates and the pilot study, and if so, then that would be contingent upon that, that regulatory compliance piece with the NSF standards, so. Any board questions? Yeah, I just, I do. Um, what was the, like say we, 
did get an estimate from Master Meter, and what's the time frame we're looking at to install AMI? We, because we, and for the most part, can um, just pop out the registers, the AMR registers, and replace them with the AMI registers for most of our 5 8 inch meters, which make up about 90% of our meter base. Um, it would only, I think, take a couple years. Um, we are only really looking at having to replace some of the larger meters and replace the registers for those meters as well. A couple years. So I think it's a two-year um, time span is reasonable. Okay, thank you. Bruce, you had questions? I, I have the same question. So uh, the AMI, the Ad Advanced Metering Infrastructure System, mm -hmm. it's two years to replace all of our users or part or? Yeah, two years, and that's because we don't actually have to pull the meters out. It's a simple uh, exchange of registers. And then once you exchange that register, is there additional work in terms of software and? and yeah, and, and so. To the district and? There, there is a, um, we would have to upgrade to um, the Harmony software is what they call it, and that's not expected to be uh, real-time extensive. It's pretty similar to the current software that we use for the AMR meters. There would be some training involved there. Um, we could um, phase in our implementation of this. You don't have to have the base station or the collectors in place. You can still drive by and read these registers until you get those collectors in place. So that's probably the biggest um, uh, time challenge is, is making sure you have enough collectors and you're getting, the signals are getting sent. So and you, you'd have to get sites for collectors and. Yeah, and luckily so we. A couple years or is it? I, I think um, right now what we're doing is we've gotten Master Meter all of the data that they need about the properties that we own and the elevations of those properties and they're doing the propagation study right now with that information. So. Um, that has to be done, and then you also have to um, apply to the FCC for licensing, and they do that for us, it's, and it's not very expensive. Um, the product is, has to be registered with the FCC. So we're looking at, if we were to say go now, we'd probably be, um, I would say, two to three months out before we could start exchanging the registers. And then the software, there's there's different there's software internal, but to me one of the big advantages of all this is that people can look at their their usage on an app. Yeah. Is that's is that the same time frame? And is that, that um, is probably the last piece that gets implemented is you want to make sure everything's up and running, and then you got to get people to um, participate, and we would probably do an outreach campaign to um, get people to download the app and be able to log in to their, their uh, usage and, and see how that's working. Um, I know some other agencies that have done it, they have to build up their participation in the app. It doesn't just happen overnight where you have all of your users joining that process. But, but Shelly, the, the app is fully developed and being utilized yes. now? Yes. Just can add on to that, just so, but we would, if we detected a leak before people were on checking themselves, we would be able to get to them that day. Yeah. You know. They'd be right. automatic. Yeah. But they wouldn't know Correct. where the leak was. Algorithms. We'd we, pick it up if we're be still doing drive-by reading, oh, we would one. still be, it would be once a month. It's not until we get the collectors right. in place, and then, yeah, we would be getting the alerts, and we could let people once know. Once it's all in place, mm -hmm. then we would get an alert. Yes. And then we could forward that to them, if they, even if they don't have the app working. Correct. Okay. And how many so years would that be? I think the app could probably be in place by the end of the two years. Realistically, so that's for leaks, but there's the the advantage also of changing uh, habits for water usage. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's and and you're right. Not everyone's going to get the app right away, but 
mm-hmm. I think people would would be very um, I think there'd be a number of people who who would like to see their water usage and would change their habits mm-hmm. Can I ask also something? depending on what rate structure we go on it could be a real asset to the consumer select type of rate structure too yes uh, but it, so which one is more ready to go into a pilot study um, well I mean as soon as we get FCC licensing and the board says and we're able to kind of firm up the cost and come back to you and ask mm-hmm. for your direction I think that'll probably be about another month or two out um, then we could basically start purchasing that product and replacing registers and go you from can do there. it neighborhood by neighborhood so you could go ahead and test out yeah you have to do it regionally um, because you need the tower in that close proximity to pick up those reeds mm-hmm. so that would it wouldn't really work for that other project uh, at the last from the last meeting that we were talking about the sub metering wouldn't work to do a test um, testing. yeah I mean we could go ahead and and put in those hybrid AMR AMI registers mm-hmm. and then just read them um, in the regular drive-by mode until we get towers but those two projects are in close proximity so we could really look at getting a tower in that area sooner than mm-hmm. um, some other areas if that was going to be our pilot well, you started off by talking about needing to investigate before you see if you go down the AMI route. Mm-hmm. How long do you think that investigation would take? Because I don't want to hold these people up. Yeah. Um, like I said, we've made some contacts with other agencies. We've talked to three other groups in Southern California that have installed them. I'm really thinking that we ought to um, possibly take a trip to Texas to look at where the system's fully deployed and they're using the app Um, so I would say a couple months and we'll have a really good solid idea of Mm -hmm. what we think we should do and come back to you and see what you think that's not long I have a question Sure. it was back to the boy Um, as I recall it was it learns and you could figure out where the leak is easier with it? Yeah, the buoy um, is able to establish um, patterns of use by different devices, and they did say that it does learn those patterns, and so it can distinguish whether you're using water in your shower or your laundry or your landscape, um, whereas AMI systems aren't that advanced. They're not, I mean, you could collect data logs or you could actually collect the data and evaluate it on a case-by-case basis and probably be able to determine, oh yeah, that's irrigation or that's something indoors, but it's not the same. So it wouldn't tell you if you had a toilet leak versus a break in your pipe? No. My wall and in my ceiling. (laughs) I had two bizarre leaks in my house. but would it? But could somebody look at their own data on a enough of a finite enough of a fine time scale to be able to see when the usage happened? Yes. Okay. In fact, the obvious the obvious thing you can do is detect what kind of toilets they have because if you see five gallons, five gallons, five gallons, five gallons, five gallons, <laughs> they have a five gallon toilet. <laughs> you can see when it happened and how much water it was, right. but you d- it doesn't go beyond that. And I think the first question you had about can you actually see where the leak is, the answer is no, because it's just, you know, here's your, your pipe and you've got a meter on the pipe and you don't know where it goes and where, so as yeah. to, as to so exactly it, where it's leaking. So if your toilet's running all the time, you wouldn't know that. Well, you would see you constant might. flow. Well, you yeah, might. you would see middle constant night, flow. Mm-hmm. You'd see some usage that But I had constant expected. flow coming out of my wall and I didn't yeah. <laughs> see it until it broke. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we need to hear from the public. Yes, I just and, and the, so there are no more questions by the board. No. Nope. Let's open it up to the public. So come on up. I would, uh, 
filled with additionality here. Yeah. <coughs> How's it going? Okay, how are you? Good. So we just had a few comments uh, and questions about some th things that you said and just to talk a little bit uh, more about the buoy product. Mm -hmm. So in general, it does do leak detection similar to that. Some other benefits that you can do with the buoy is turn it off immediately. So I was wondering how is how does the process go with SoCal Creek if you had the AMI? So say I had a leak at my house, I wasn't home or something, and the AMI was installed already. How would how would you handle it? Does someone go out there and and shut off the water for me? Or yeah, the you know the buoy has um, uh, the remote shut off, like right. I mentioned, whereas the AMI system doesn't. The AMI system that we're looking at sends a read every 12 hours, so there is some potential savings there in terms of earlier notification with the buoy. Um, I think the way that it would work is um, we would notify the customer once we got the alert, and we don't. I think going out to the site and shutting off the water would be dependent upon the volume of water being lost. We're not going to go out if it's, you know, a small little leak. I think we um, even do that now, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you would have a benefit with the buoy of quicker notification and the remote shut off that the AMI system wouldn't have. Okay. Um. <clears throat> But you have to recognize that's going to decrease how much savings you're credited for the buoy against the AMI because you, you would get 12 hours of savings instead of half a month of savings. Understandable. If someone went out there and shut it off within 12 hours, yeah, right? right? But if, for example, someone's not home or I'm not sure if you need someone or if you guys just go turn it off or you need to get a hold of someone. But, you know, there's yeah. that, that goes into mm -hmm. it. Um, so we talked about the buoy providing more detail. Mm -hmm. um, so with the buoy, you can tell exactly what is running, right? Automatically that happens. There's no need to research it by a member of staff. Um, there's also, it, the other thing it detects is high usage and waste usage. So if you, if your toilet is running, for example, I'm not sure if the AMI will specifically pick that up or say you have irrigation that's leaking. Um, you're going to have to enlighten me there, but a buoy would tell you that you're using water when you're not home, whereas the AMI would not necessarily, like, you wouldn't really know, like, yeah, I wasn't home, there shouldn't be any water running on, unless you were sitting there watching your meter. Does that, does that make sense? Well, the existing system already does that it, it, because it can tell you it's been running 24 hours a day for the last month, and so you know there's a leak. Yeah, it's the intermittent high usage that is kind of more harder to detect, but um, we, do, we do monitor that in our office once the reads come in with our current system. Um, they look at past usage. Um, believe it or not, for 15,000 accounts, they're able to pick out quite a few cases of, of high usage and flag that, but it wouldn't be immediate. Again, okay. it would be once every, you know, 30 days. 30 days right mm -hmm. now. Okay, thank you. <coughs> John, do you have a couple of questions? Um, I just wanted to, um, that's about it. Um, regarding, I did want to say regarding the um, uh, Bachelor uh, coupling device, um, <coughs> Uh, it is an, actually an accessory piece to the buoy. Uh, it's not required for normal operation. Um, if, if we can't get uh, confirm, confirmation that it does meet the uh, NSF standards, then we can actually just remove that from the package. And um, it's not something that's actually required. Uh, so far as we know, everything does meet the NSF uh, standards and um, yeah, we're still working on getting actual um, confirmation of that. But okay, thank you. Um, so, it, if I can understand the timeline for you guys, you would want to go check out the other systems in Texas, mm -hmm. and then time to get everything approved and get a tower 
and everything in place is still a little ways out. Like um, eight months to a year. I think the evaluation is a couple months, okay. and yeah, getting a tower in place is going to be probably the the longest timeline. Uh, we can go ahead and start switching out registers for existing services or putting those systems in for new services like we've talked about with Aptos Village and Rancho Del Mar. Um, but getting the towers in place is probably uh, the last step in that pilot, I think, and then the app, but yeah. So there would still be some time savings for Bowie. We could, we could hit the ground running right now with Bowie, right? So we would um, be able to. Yeah, if we can get verification of the NSF and then we also need some, um, need to come back to the board with the adjusted calculations and um, have them uh, verify that they want to move ahead with that. Um, and then you, you know, for you to verify that you want to move ahead right. based on whatever decisions made with how much water can be saved per unit and whether that's cost effective for you or not is, you know, something you'll have to decide. So that's, I think, where we are. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the cost per unit is? Cost of a buoy right now is 800, and they do run some specials. Last month, I think, was 499. So, um, so 500 to 800. Yeah, 500 to 800. And um, yeah, um, I think we also need to. Um, there was um, the pilot study, and so there needs to be a determination about whether. Um, the water savings estimate is going to be grant credited to your project regardless of the outcome of the pilot or if it's going to be dependent upon the outcome of the pilot and um, we'll have to go from there that's the tough thing mm -hmm. just to because we were talking about what advantage does it give over our current system and that would be one number but now we're talking about maybe the current system won't be the current system, it'll be this other system, so the savings of buoy against that would be much less, we mm -hmm. presume. So, and, and you're talking about, you know, putting it in while the buoy, put the buoy in for some areas that won't get it for a while, so they might not get it for a year, so you get a year's worth of credits, and that'd be even less, and I, I, it'd be complicated, yeah. but partially it's up to you guys. if you think this is not going to give you enough savings uh, I mean, right now I'd say wait for two months and see whether we're even doing this or not okay because against our current system it'd be a lot better savings than against AMI right An another possibility <coughs> is to target you know um, areas that won't get the AMI soon right. and also um, users that are high end where you'd probably get more savings if for people who use a lot of water yeah. like you you know my household you wouldn't get much savings yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there there are some 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 households where there you'd be amazed at how much water is used yeah and I don't know whether this would would facilitate an awareness that would then result in a decrease in water use but that's all we're looking for is, is the decrease in water use any way that it can happen. Right. It, I, had just had, I think you, we went over this before, but I was wondering if, you know, there, I know there's no consumer report on the reliability and uh, like how well it works because it's, it's the software, it's dependent on, you know, software not having any glitches or crashing or anything like that. Do you, is there enough enough users who've had it for long enough to have a track record on that? Can you speak to that? <laughs> she, she I mean, because the <laughs> essential thing about the buoy is it is a user, the customer is the user. Yeah, that's a great question, Hillary Bryant with Buoy Labs. Um, so to your question, we've been in pilot testing for over two and a half years. We've tested across the country in a variety of different climates and locations just for, uh, not just to test the software, but to test the product in different installation conditions. So um, it's it's two and a half years of, of really rigorous testing, both in labs and being back tested against 
um, lab equipment and then in actual physical homes across the country. Um, and then if I could ad address the um, NSF question. So the, um, the, it was brought to my attention this afternoon about the couplings, the, their badger or spuds or meter couplings. They're typically not used in any of the, ins in fact, most I can think of maybe two that we've used them in, but the majority of our installs, especially in the state of California, are outdoor installs, so you're using copper couplings. So it's, it's the copper couplings directly to the buoy. So, um, and we could certainly take those out of any installation in, in Soquel Creek. Um, and in fact, I think they probably wouldn't be used regardless because we're usually doing copper to, to the buoy because they're outdoor installations. Um, and then in regards to an opportunity for savings, you know, our software is very robust. It's very consumer friendly. It's ready to go right now. It doesn't require towers. Um, and we could certainly focus on high users um, and areas where perhaps we're, we're not going to do the switch out or we're not going to do, um, we're not going to be able to put the tower in immediately um, and, and focus a pilot on that and run it against the AMI as you install it. So you really could have some true comparison to the product that you're putting in in the district and the buoy product. Um, and the, 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 but the biggest difference is not just the real time and the granularity of the information, but that ability to shut off your water from wherever you're at. I can even tell you, um, uh, a bit embarrassing, but the other night, two nights ago, I was asleep and got a notification on my, on my <laughs> watch that there was a leak in the house and my toilet had been running and I probably slept through a couple of those, but I caught it at about 110 gallons that had been running for an hour, it was two in the morning, one of my kids had flushed the toilet and, and, and I actually got up and shut the water off. So that's an hour and 20 some minutes of use and had it gone all night, it would have been close to five or 600 gallons. And for most of us, you know, we d even with the ability of AMI, that notification and those push to our devices and, and alerting people and then giving them the ability to just shut the water off from where they're at, it, it, it does result in some pretty immediate and impressive savings. But I think the challenge for all of us is rather than stories, we need to have some data to estimate what the savings Absolutely. actually would be out in the field. Absolutely. And that's why I think maybe mm -hmm. perhaps running buoy with against some of these units that you're already, if you're able to install them in the next few months, um, could give you a, a, a real true pilot mm -hmm. in comparison as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How's that sound? Uh, it sounds interesting. I, I, I'd like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, so I love the innovativeness of the of the product. So thank thank everybody for who's involved with that. I have a my understanding is this sends a signal through your Wi-Fi probably up to the cloud, and some magic happens up there, and it rains back down, so to speak. Do you ever envision uh, in your in your business model? I mean, is is it free for that right now? Is there going to be a subscription rate at some point? Can you can you? enlighten us on that yeah every so right now um to the cost it's 7.99 and that includes an installation by a licensed plumber um and in fact uh, i think we had a, a letter from we've been using santa cruz plumbing locally for our installs um and and our vision for any type of pilot like this is that that data is your data for the lifetime of the product so it runs on your wi-fi that we could certainly work with the district to give the information in aggregate so you could understand about the the each device and what is being being used, but everybody's information is their private information, and that would belong. Right, to and I respect that. I'm just wondering if there, the, if the, if you envision a, a fee, a subscription fee of any sort, uh, for the cloud work and all that uh, out in time, or is there one currently? No, for the no, product? there's not one currently. That the 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 the, the way it w our our current model is 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 around this. Um, the, the fee is for the hardware and the installation, and then the, the data runs off, like I said, the customer's Wi-Fi, so it's not connected to a, if there was a cellular component, then there there would be a fee, but right now that's not Okay, and that costs 500, 800, um, that included the, the labor to install? It's, right now we're selling them seven, we had done a special um, for five, uh, 499, including install, but right now we're doing it at 799, including installation. Okay. And our installations typically take about an hour and a half to two hours. Thank you. You mentioned uh, Wi-Fi. What if the customer doesn't have Wi-Fi? How's that? So then, it, right now, it doesn't work. We we've thought about going to um, a cellular option for people who are in rem remote areas, but again, that would require a fee because it's just an expense. Okay. So, just want to second what President Daniels said about if there's hard data, it it 
sounds like you might have s some data on just the effect of having the buoy in terms of reduction in water use. It, you know, it's probably too small a sample to really get at the, uh, the leak issue because there's a lot of variety in how leaks can happen and when they can happen. But I'd be curious to, you know, and receptive to if, if people who do install a buoy by having a greater awareness of their water use decrease their water use and so that to me would be a, a potential place for a credit thank you thank you <coughs> thanks guys yeah uh, question for um, staff regarding the um, excuse me uh, letters you mentioned we actually do have a couple letters from uh, one from Santa Cruz plumbing and one from uh, uh, Robert Singleton at the uh, Santa Cruz County <coughs> Business Council um, just showing their recommendation for the project as well and um, okay. Okay. I had two other points. Um, we had talked about numbers previously mm -hmm. um, when we met after the last meeting. Is that something that's pertinent now, discussing how the numbers that you came up with? The water savings estimates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we did take a look at that, and we found that with our AMR data, um, we're not able to really get at how long on average leaks go on for. Mm. We, we kind of have an idea of the most common leak uh, amount and how many leaks that we detected, but we don't know how long they went on for. So that piece of, of data is missing. And so we would have to make some assumptions there. And I think you said cut the billing period in half, 14, 15 days, and, and base it on that. Um, we did uh, look. I think um, we looked at another study, the residential end use study, which came out in 2016, and that's also a national study. And the volumes um, of water loss to leaks were actually greater than that 10% of total water that EPA um, and the WaterSense program touted, which is what we used in our initial calculations. So we feel that the the numbers that we use the first time around are, are pretty reasonable and conservative compared to some of the other data that's out there. And that's kind of where we landed and we're just waiting to see if you want us to, to kind of finalize that work and bring it back. Maybe we, we do that um, and then you decide if you want us to move ahead with the pilot um, as opposed to doing both now and, and I think we should we should finish the calculations and see what the board thinks and see if the applicant wants to proceed based on what you decide and then if so then kind of study uh, initiate the pilot study um, that pilot study um, would have to be pretty much developed by the applicant because um, our staff resources are pretty limited especially since we're really looking at this AMI migration um, we could, of course, provide some guidance to them, but uh, I think really it's got to be on the applicant to, to come up with that pilot plan, pilot study. Thank you. Um, we are looking forward to proceeding, if possible. So um, I think there's some good points mentioned that we could get some previous data. We can talk to other clients of Bowie and get some recommendations. And compare it, as Hillary said, compare it to the AMI when that rolls out. Um, so I think there's still potential here, and we would prefer to continue if possible. Um, and thank you. One other um, component of the AMI project that we're looking at is calculating internally how much water we can save if we deploy this, yeah. you know, district wide and coming up with some estimates there and coming back to the board and asking whether um, we can use water demand offset fees to fund um, this implementation of AMI uh, based on that water savings. So if um, that was this, it's expected to be a pretty sizable amount. We've done some preliminary calculations and uh, there's pretty significant water savings, and if that was something that you approved, then we could basically reestablish our offset credit bank like we did when we retrofit toilets um, years ago and probably 
it, that would eliminate the need for applicants to go out and do kind of their own projects unless they really wanted to. Right. Well, does anyone else in the audience wish to address us on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I have um, questions, I guess, for both systems. Um, my, th my question about the buoy system is how would it accommodate um, vacation rentals when there might be a lot of different uses depending on how many people rent the home and how much how many people there are and what kind of water use they are and how would it adapt to that how would the buoy system adapt to changes in ownership of the property and then um, regarding the ami i'm not really clear about what that is exactly i'm hearing that it's it's a radio transmitting if you've got to get an fcc license and you're talking about towers um, what exactly does this system mean for the general public? What are the towers gonna look like? Um, what's the, uh, the power level that will be transmitted from homes and uh, to homes if, if it goes that direction? And I guess um, also I'm, I'm curious with the recent news, <laughs> how safe is this information that's being transmitted wireless uh, in both systems uh, to prevent it from being hacked and and uh, maybe put to a, a not a good use. Those are my questions, and thank you very much. Yeah, those are good questions. So may I add a few comments? Sure, um, indeed. Uh, for the board's evaluation, three things come to mind for me that I just want to make us aware of. Uh, one is, you know, what value will we get out of this? And there, and I. And the first to love innovation and think there may be some some data that comes out of it that could be valuable but weighing that against uh the again the limited staff resources so that's another thing i'm not making a pitch one way or the other but you know that we're pretty stretched as it is and then the the third thing i think to take into consideration uh, as i sit here because i i've been doing the d water demand offset program or i did do it um for I don't know, f 12 years or something like that. And when I first came on, um, it, it was, it, we really had a zero in on the, on the products that we were giving our customers. I mean, we, we actually had ended up going to third party, um, water sense approved, you know, for not only performance, but for parts, insurance and durability. And uh, I'm sure the product is great, but a, a concern that I do have for our customers and I have to look out for them and express this is, you know, there's a relatively new product that would be out um, in potentially in our customers' homes with our kind of blessing behind it, so to speak, that, um, you know, it, something could happen in, the, in a few years out and you know what would be the recourse then? I'm through. I'm sure through some contractual arrange arrangements we could, uh, you know, shift liability wherever. But that's another factor to take into to consideration. Well, I think it wouldn't replace the AMR or AMI, so that would be our portal. But and then you're right that if the system were to fail, the user may have to replace it or just take it out. But um, we would still have an AMR device there that would be our meter. I think. It's it. Oh yeah, I suppose. So, um, two questions. One, what does the cost end up being per meter for the AMI? About. I don't have that with me. Um, it, it. So, if you Ballpark. just buy, if you just buy the register mm -hmm. itself, I think it's about a hundred and twenty dollars, which that with is the a forty percent, forty percent discount. And if you Obviously, if you buy the register and the meter, right. um, I think it's... That's okay. I mainly meant yeah. the replacement one. And then you mentioned 12 hours um, is what the frequency of sending the data so would be. So that's how often the data is actually sent to the collector or tower. They're not giant towers. Um, that's probably a... But collector is probably a better description. Um, they're only sent every 12 hours, but you can actually... Um, you can actually collect uh, more reads than that. I think it's every every 30 seconds or something. It it can 
But as far as us getting the data, yes. there would be a 12-hour lag between yes. either us or the consumer getting mm -hmm. the information about a leak. Yeah, if I understood it correctly when we talked to them, it's, it's not a, a, a lag. I mean, you would get, yeah, well, yeah, I guess 12, you know, what's the last 12 hours of usage? Right. The reason for that is battery life. Mm -hmm. That understood You could do it more I frequently, but you're going to wear your battery down sooner. Right. So that's. Okay. And then my last comment is just that, you know, it's seems like additionality w if we do decide I mean we've we'd already kind of decided we wanted to go this way eventually anyway so I, I think it's going to be hard to meet that additionality standard for more than a couple years if that's the way we may go so yeah. that's all and I think we should make the AMI decision that's based on our own desire and own needs right we shouldn't be Definitely. should yeah. be predicated on you know, this or, or not this. No, exactly. Right. But I, I think there could be areas where we're not going to do AMI soon mm -hmm. and that this there, there might be a niche. Yeah. Yep. Or a niche for mm -hmm. this. Yeah. There, there, are, there also may be areas in our mountainous region where the AMI may, may, AMI may not have complete coverage, so there may be another opportunity there, but we, we won't know that till the... Um, evaluation study done. and in that case you can put in um, repeater devices which are pretty small devices you can install those to uh, transmit the signal in those hard to reach areas so so it sounds like we'll we need a couple months to get a little more info mm -hmm. okay. so what what is the staff commitment if we decide that we want to you know tell Tell them to proceed. Is it um, hours, days, weeks? Well, finishing the calculations and bringing that back to you won't be that time consuming. But um, the pilot study, uh, I have some concerns about how long that, how much staff time that might take. Um, you know what, what's acceptable and what's not, and um, you know we just we haven't done a pilot study before I don't think except for maybe irrigation autumn uh, irrigation controllers we did the irrigation controllers we actually did it when we installed the uh, AMR yeah initially um, it's about a six-month pilot study it would involve that it would probably involve some uh, legal paperwork just for protection yeah, like Ron said the liability release if if um, somebody's going to install it um, like for what we do for toilets now is they have a release of liability that the applicant has to get the customer to sign that um, you know doesn't implicate the district if there if anything goes wrong sure. yeah so that would all have to be part of the process to the pilot process and well there's I another know. there's Let's another railroad track here too which is we have this special deal some of our AMRs are failing and we need to replace them and do we replace them with another AMR or do we replace it with an AMI? Yeah. In which case we could still do the drive-by for for years. Mm -hmm. So, and then the separate decision is, do we install the infrastructure to be able to do the 12 hour reads? And that's a different decision because yeah. we, can, we can install the AMI meters everywhere in our district and just not use them for that. And then some point time later, we could install the infrastructure to do the reads. Um, I, I, you know, it's hard to give you a number to go back to the original question, the, the staffing, but, you know, there's just these ramifications of, you know, legal to the website, to the calculations. You know, I'll, I'll throw a number out there. I'm, I'm going to say it's going to be about 80 hours uh, of staff time, you know, and that's, that's a ballpark estimate with no real data behind it, but just having worked in that seat for a long time, do you, do you think that's even reasonable, Shelley? Might be low. <laughs> Might be less. Particularly yeah. if you're taking trips back to Texas, that's. Uh, yeah, I was talking about for the buoy. The for the buoy. The buoy. Okay. Well, yeah, because we, I mean, even designing the pilot study would be a little bit problematic because you'd have to get a it's wide true. enough area to make it. I mean, you have the before and after, which, but it has to be a wide enough area, since uh, the leak leaks don't are random mostly, and. And then we're going to want to track. Um, consumption <laughs> at the properties where it is installed um, for our own purposes and to compare to what data we can um, get from Bowie, which is going to be, um, like Hillary said, not uh, customer specific, but 
it's probably just going to be looking at the whole pool of people that are participating in the pilot. We're going to want to kind of compare that, that information. And so there will be some time spent there on setting that spreadsheet up and tracking that and um, generating reports and evaluating that information. So, But even that is going to be tricky to use because we probably don't have previous data on these customers that have the buoy units now. So we don't know whether they're saving or how much they're saving well, it, over how they... You would only want to install the buoy in customers' homes that are, are established homes and there's at least a couple years of baseline data that you can compare to. If, if we did mm. a pilot here, yes, mm -hmm. but if you look at the what beta is that they've been doing, yeah. I don't know whether we have, they have, the customer data from previous years That'd which would allow you to do a comparison. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're yeah. because we talked about it'll let you know whether it's the toilet or it's the washing machine, but we can't know whether that's saving anything by people knowing that information uh, unless we had previous prior data. data. Right, and that 80 hours didn't include a, a post pilot analysis. I, I, you know, in my mind, the way I envisioned it, and I may be off, but it'd be less quantitative and more qualitative interviewing those uh, recipients, seeing if they found it of value. If they felt it changed their habits, you know, we'd look and see what we could. But there's going to be a lot of variable to that. Um, so I, I think it'd be more of the qualitative nature than the quantitative. But it has to be part of part of our criteria is that it's measurable. Right, and you may have to lot rely on those statistics that come up. Um, that Shelley promoted earlier, the EPA number of 10% uh, of usage is leak loaded to leaks and. And I don't know if you'll ever get to a, a true number what, unless we invest, you know, you're talking, I mean, just statistically, you would need um, a lot. You don't think that, <coughs> like other places who have used it, whether it's Texas or somewhere else, have prior data and can compare what they're doing now? We've been asking, we asked the people in Southern California if they had gone through any analyses of, of water savings before they employed the AMI and if they've done anything after and um, they're in Southern California, no one has the same issues that we have here apparently. So there's not a lot to go on and we haven't um, talked with the people in Texas yet. Uh, they do have some uh, pretty significant water issues so maybe they've done some more studies and estimates and evaluations. I thought you were talking about the, the buoy system. You were talking about the AMI system? No, I'm talking about buoy. Buoy? Oh, Those I thought you were talking because you yeah. said something well, about Texas. Okay, well, so. there, wherever they have data, there's got to be some data that shows where they put it in and, and, and the AMI so you can kind of compare what's happened with yeah, the Yeah, I don't, I'm not quite sure what data buoy has. Um, but I mean, we uh, the AMI system too, they should be able to have data on water use before and after installation. Yeah, and you can, and and we can estimate, you know, we did the back of the envelope. We know roughly how much is lost through leaks like that, and if we detect every month and um, it stops, and we can do it, you know, and then if we're going to detect yeah. every 12 hours, we that's the kind of the back of the envelope we've done with that's AMI. That's assuming no behavioral changes, just leak, leaks. E yes. Yeah. So there could be problems with this. But do we do we want to say no at this point? I I think it's pretty cool that they're trying to come up with a good idea like this. I don't think I think it would be worth myself having investigating where we are with the AMI and do I don't know how long it takes to do the calculations and figure out. I'm worried that it won't be enough to be worth it for them if we're gonna if we choose to go to AMI eventually. Well. That's but really up to them, right? Right, but I, I don't know. I think it's worth investigating a little further. We need to know about AMI anyway. <laughs> we do, but I don't know what to tell them now as to how much credit they could have. Because I don't either. If we start doing this, you know, the buoy installation, and then you know, six months later they get AMIs. No, do they, go back and take away some of the credit we've given them. No. I, we have to have an estimate and make a decision of whether we're going forward. We need to wait for the AMI decision. Right. Exactly. That's the consensus. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm personally con intrigued by the buoy, the whole buoy system, but I can see that, you know, the AMI is more wi potentially widespread, and um, but uh, I don't think we could have the answer on, you know, what the numbers and whether it's really worth it to you yet. I agree with that part of it, but if you can wait a few more months, then. Or if you just want to go install some on spec and for the fun of it, that's fine too, but. Uh, and actually do your own study, your own pilot study. Yeah. I mean, you don't, it, it doesn't come, need to come through the water district, does no. it? You can, no. I know, I was thinking about getting one for myself. Or if there's, can be identified an area where AMI won't be used soon, mm -hmm. where the buoy system could have a, a large impact. Start. Perhaps we come back in a couple months with a update on what we've learned about AMI in terms of cost and and uh, implementation plan, um, those sorts of, of things, and then um, we can you can decide at that time. How yeah, you want to proceed? I, and I'd be receptive to seeing estimates. I don't want you know. I want the onus really to be more on the applicant than on the staff, but I know that staff's going to have to be involved. So. Yeah, we just didn't want them to move forward and miss step. That's why Shelly brought it back, trying to be fair mm -hmm. and looking out for them to too. The right thing. Because okay. mm -hmm. something has <coughs> changed. So are we. So I, I mean, I, I, I would tell, I mean, I guess I, the consensus seems to be, and I don't know if it's not really a motion thing, that, that you proceed and find out about AMI. You can't commit to, to them right now. They have to kind of wait a couple months and see where we are on that decision. Because mm -hmm. we, we don't know how much credit to, it would be worth. Yeah. And since this credit is going to be a guesstimate, even in the best cases, uh, it wouldn't hurt to have a guesstimate of, their thing versus AMR and their thing versus AMI. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you do come back. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So we've done with that one, 6-3, so we move on to 6-4. And I do want to encourage you. I, I like okay. the idea. It's sure. Just, sure. It's, whenever you're doing something so innovative, it, you have to to break new ground and it's difficult. Mm -hmm. So, and, we, and we, we do have to have something that's measurable and, and that, additional. Uh, additional, yeah. Thank you all. Staff proposal to discontinue tracking and enforcement of local retrofit on sale plumbing fixture ordinances. And I have uh, Roy Sykes, our conservation specialist here tonight to give a summary of this item. Roy's been managing and enforcing the ROS program since 2003 in the city of Cap for the city of Capitola and since 2013 I believe for the county of Santa Cruz within our service area boundaries so go ahead Roy. Yeah. Okay good evening yeah um, so we have been doing the enforcement on behalf of the city of Capitola since September of 2003 and that's uh, an, a local ordinance that requires uh, older fixtures to be replaced with newer fixtures when the property is sold. So the compliance is involved with um, tracking real estate transactions on a monthly basis. That costs about $1,800 a year. That, that information is provided through a private vendor. We uh, receive uh, the monthly uh, file and then ch uh, check that against a uh, database and the properties that don't have uh, certificates we send a compliance letter to. Uh, typically those letters are responded to and they get a certificate. A certain number never get a response and so those properties are recorded. Uh, that's the teeth of the ordinance. Uh, in those cases now there's a new rub, January 1st of 2018, uh, a law was enacted by the state uh, state of California whereby $75, they're now assessing those fees on public agencies, and that puts us in a bind because we really uh, can't recover those costs. Uh, we'd be required to pay those on behalf of a customer, and uh, that 
could constitute uh, a problem with our operational laws. Uh, that's pretty important. Another um, uh, <coughs> reality that's occurring is because of our water demand offset program and our rebate program and the Waterwise House calls and other uh, manners in which we've distributed toilets, faucet aerators, shower heads, we've got a pretty good uh, saturation with new fixtures. Now only about 1% of toilets are now coming up as non-compliant um, since we've been doing this. And we've been doing this, as, as Shelley said, since 2003 in Capitola. And in 2014, uh, in March of 2014, we uh, expanded that to the county of Santa Cruz. So the plumbing codes are kicking in and we're kind of chasing a diminishing returns. Uh, that's the reason that we're presenting this memo uh, to kind of uh, consider those, those realities now. Kind of the wages of success, isn't it? I suppose so, yeah. The, the effort's being duplicated. Mm -hmm. uh, and in light of the discussions now about staff time and whatnot, um, about 40% of my time is spent uh, tracking and enforcing this, writing letters and, and going to the county and doing inspections. So uh, that's a pretty big chunk of time. Can you, where questions? do you even buy yeah, a five-gallon toilet anymore? <laughs> Probably Amazon, <laughs> the dark web, I don't know. That, that's a good question. You actually can't buy the 1.6 gallons per flush toilets in the state of California anymore, which, which are okay to be. That, that yeah, 1.6 1, 1. is compliant, yeah. So it's self-limiting and so it was inevitable. But yep, we got there pre would come. pretty fast, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I had a question of if you, were there any alternatives or other ideas you had for either encouraging the city and the county or working with them to still not lose that remaining 10%. <laughs> the, the county, um, ha, you know, has a program in, in the rest of the county areas um, that don't include the city of Santa Cruz's service area and they, they manage the program but they don't, their enforcement is not as vigorous as what we've been doing. So I, I would think that they're going to continue, they're going to reincorporate our service area into their program and that the city of Capitola has the option of, of kind of doing the same. It's more of a, uh, what did you call it, Roy? Um, uh, uh, trust, more of a, a trust program. Um, like and the realtors, you know, are kind of helping basically people comply with it. So you're liable to get partial credit, but not full. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's why we took it over from the county, is they've been doing it. So they were the first ones to do it, and I think before 2003. Um, but we felt that in 2013 that uh, we could gain some more water savings if we actively started enforcing it like we were doing for the city of Capitola. And we took that on knowing that it probably wasn't going to be a long uh, endeavor. So... Um, you know, we're, we're planning to go back and work with those entities to make sure that there's a smooth transition, whatever they want to do, and that all of the realtors know um, so they can get the word out to the community. And, of course, all of our outreach materials will be updated to, to clarify what people need to do. Yeah, I understand it's a lot of time and effort. It's, I hate to lose any potential savings. But like Roy said, it's a very small sliver. Return. Yeah. yeah. And also, I think the memo states that in two years, the city of Santa Cruz is going to stop their program. And, that, and I think we had a more uh, accelerated replacement program than they did. Mm -hmm. By uh, way of example, what 1% of toilets is about 160 toilets uh, a year out of uh, 6,000 or something like that. It's, 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 a pretty, it's a pretty small. I mean, it's in that. It's, mm -hmm. it, in the showerhead count as well is uh, really starting to starting to dwindle where we have to have them change the shower heads out mm -hmm. so um, and most of those are in the county as you say the county probably would continue something yeah they would need to there's a uh, there's some requirements uh, related to the urban water management plans that require some sort of a, a retrofit program mm -hmm. those would continue to be administered we uh, we would have there's some inertia to the program. Uh, we do still have 57 properties that have been recorded, and we uh, maintain the release forms. Mm -hmm. So there would have to be some maintenance involved with that. 
until the time came when we could convey those to either the county or the city of Capitola. Mm -hmm. uh, so the sunset wouldn't uh, divest us completely of these duties, but it would, it would surely um, make them a lot smaller. Yeah. Anyone in the public wish to address us on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I just had an idea. Maybe um, you could work with the realtors and um, property managers and offer a carrot that if um, the fixtures that are in the house that's being sold do not meet these and, and as part of the transaction they are upgraded, then it would be a discount or maybe a month of free water or something that would be an incentive for the new owners to do the changes at the time of the transaction. It was just a thought I had, a positive incentive. Thank you. Anyone else? See no one? Okay. What's the consensus? Do it, I'll move, I'll move. <laughs> For on, on either on number one. Okay. I'll second it. Good. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. So we go on to 6.5. Approved consultant for the finance plan and rate study. Thanks for all your good work, Roy. Yep. As always. You'll find some other way to save water. So this evening, I'm bringing back to you um, the results of the request for proposals that we sent out um, for a multi-year uh, finance plan and rate study. We had three qualified firms um, that we sent the submissions to, and only one of those actually responded with a proposal. We also had two un unsolicited proposals that we received. Um, so the Water Rates Advisory Committee met last week and reviewed all three of the proposals, talked over some of the pros and cons of each one of them. And the recommendation was made to go ahead and move forward with Raf Tellus. They actually offered us some really, <clears throat> really nice services that were included in their proposal that kind of made them stand out from the others. Um, they are offering the services of a technical reviewer to actually review their, their work um, for accuracy and quality of work, which is uh, it's, it's a nice feature to have. That wasn't included in any of the other proposals. They also were one of the only um, firms to actually speak to the importance of public outreach as part of the rate study efforts. They are um, going to provide an impact analysis graphic for each of the different bill scenarios and how the impact um, would be on our customers and we can include that type of information in our Proposition 218 um, materials. They, um, all three of the firms were going to go ahead and provide us with the rate model, but Raf Tellus was the only one that offered uh, time and training to um, educate staff on how to use the model. So there were a number of different features that we felt they were providing to us irrespective of the work that they had already done on the concert or the customer select plan that made them an attractive um, option for us. So the Water Rates Advisory Committee made the recommendation to go ahead and, and do Raft tell us and accept their proposal. And um, so then what we did is we opened up the cost proposals as a result and Raft tell us actually came in higher. But when we looked at the way those proposals were being submitted, they were being submitted on an hours worked basis. So Raf Tellus actually had the most hours devoted to the project. If the hours aren't worked, we won't be billed for those hours. So it behooved us then to take a price. look at it a different way. And that's in terms of kind of average hourly cost. And so when we looked at it that way, Raf mm -hmm. Tellus was middle of the pack. Um, so we're recommending that uh, the board goes ahead and considers accepting the proposal from Raf Tellus Financial Consultants. How was the proposal from Black and Veatch since their hourly rate was the lowest? Uh, their hourly rate, how was it? How, how was their proposal? Um, they had some nice features in their proposal as well. The one proposal that I wasn't too sure about was the split proposal from ATS and, 
and the other firm because you had two different firms, one doing the yeah, uh, yeah. finance plan and one doing the rate study. Black and Veatch was all inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't offer some of these other benefits that Raft Hellas had offered us. It was a good proposal, but they didn't speak about outreach efforts. They didn't offer to train us on the use of the model. Um, they didn't have a technical reviewer in their proposal. So those were kind of the things that differentiated the two in our eyes. Okay. But the quality of the base was The quality of the base seemed, seemed sufficient. <coughs> yeah, it did. Okay. Um, they were the lowest bid in terms of the number of hours that they were going to devote to the study. But um, they did offer to go ahead and bill us at 295 an hour for any efforts in, a, in huh. excess of what they had bid. Okay. Any questions? Well, I just wanted uh, the Reptelis thing had come up uh, during the rate rate committee meetings because uh, uh, of this customer select plan that we've been trying to evaluate and are going to continue the evaluation. And Raftelis uh, Sanjay Gore, he was the he participated in the original study that developed this potential that water water utilities could use this as a way of uh, helping co uh, customers conserve water. Well, Raf Raftelis did the original modeling, but that was their North Carolina office. Pardon me? That was their North Carolina office. Yeah, but I thought Sanjay So Sanjay was worked part of on, it. on our review of it here when we had him review. Oh, the I thought he was part of the original study at North Carolina. No, that was Raftelis, but it wasn't Sanjay's team. Okay. I For what it's worth, I mean, I think in the water community, Raftelis is accepted as probably one of the best. I mean, generally, when you talk to people who talk mm -hmm. about, about rates and who they've done, and they've done some things for Metropolitan Water of Los Angeles or something in California, et cetera. And in a recent case that I mentioned to, uh, to Leslie, the, the court acknowledged them as being the better of the two, the other being Bartle Wells, who proposed a, a rate differential. It wasn't our kind of rates. It was wheeling rates. but still the, they recognize them. Mm -hmm. So they understand <coughs> the Prop 218 criteria too pretty well. They, they do. In fact, they've given seminars on Prop 218, I They're believe. They're probably one of the leading firms on understanding Prop 218. And they've given fire. talks at Aqua, I know, the conference, Aqua conference. Well, yeah. They did the last rate study for Scotts Valley too, and they were very happy with them. And I believe the last rate study for City of Santa Cruz as well. That's right. So you were on the, the committee that evaluated? Uh, Bruce and I were at the time. Do you have anything else to add? I never got this. Uh, so I think there was a meeting and I didn't get it because my email still doesn't work. And oh, no. okay. we, were in, we were at Water Reuse. Yeah, well. Okay. Uh, we got the three proposals, though. And I, I, would, I agree that the Reptile proposal is stronger. It is the most expensive. Uh, total thing. I don't expect him expect them to work fewer hours and save money that way. But on the other hand, uh, you know, it could be it's going to be a complicated study. I think uh, so. It might be worth it to have uh, that expertise. That extra expertise. And uh, sorry, um, I think the technical evaluation is really good. I don't know if there, whether that would have saved us uh, fr from the error that happened in the last rate study, but I am concerned about like the possibility of avoiding those kind of simple little errors that um, I didn't cost our customers more money, but it lo we lost money on that. So, um, so d just to clarify, if I know these are proposals or bids, so you said that it's only still based on what they time they actually spend? Right, it's on an hour's worked basis, so. Okay. They, they anticipated, I think it was 545 or 595 hours, which was more than any of the other firms had, had anticipated for this project. So, I mean, if you, 
ended up spending that number of hours and the Black and Beach proposal went over with the 295 per hour. Did you compare what that would come out to? I, I didn't run those numbers, <laughs> but it probably <laughs> would have come out very close to the rough TELUS proposal. Also, this is a consultant contract, so it's not supposed to be based solely on low bid. It's supposed to be based on their qualification. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, sure. understood. It's not like I think putting pipe in. Yeah. Tom, I think it'd be about ten to fifteen thousand dollars less if it was the same number of hours. Okay, that's what I was just trying about to figure. Ten percent lower rate. Okay. Anyone in the public wish to address us on this item? Seeing no one. Okay. Do we have more questions or discussion? Or Motions. Actually, it'd be <laughs> more. Motions. It'd be fifty-four thousand dollars more. Okay. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so it would it would be I mean it would be close it'd be like uh, one hundred and thirty-two. If Black and Beach had the same number of hours. That's about the same then. Uh. I'll move one and two. Oh, yes, one and two. I'll second it then. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Okay, 6-6, six, six, board direction on selection of standing committee members. Yeah, the, you know, the district believes in and values customer input. So a while back, the board uh, created three committees um, that uh, to help facilitate the work of the district and at that time we uh, invited uh, the board open it up to a public member uh, member of the of one of our customers to participate on each of the committees we actually have one uh, Larry Freeman's in here to tonight attending our meeting um, he's on the water resources management infrastructure committee and now uh, and recently the board upped that to two public members and so um, we have out on the street uh, advertising for uh, two public members or to apply for each of those committees. And there's a timeline there for you, April uh, 3rd through June 5th, uh, the process that will take. And really what we're asking the board for tonight is, do they wanna appoint uh, two members of the board to work with staff to go through the applications and then bring back the recommendation to the full board or have staff review those applications and then bring them all back and go through that process here uh, uh, at a regular board meeting. Uh, so when I, would that be? Um, let's see, the timeline's in here. So the, the process um, is tonight, April 3rd, you're providing direction to us regarding whether you wanna just create two board members in a selection committee. The close of the applications are April 30th, and there's advertisements out now. And then we would review those applicant, app, public member applications uh, during the month of May, come back June 5th for the uh, appointment uh, of those uh, public members. So the, it, to answer your question directly, uh, Director Christensen, it would be sometime during um, the month of May that if you if you appointed two board members and had a selection committee, staff would work with you to um, help facilitate that to provide a recommendation to the full board. Ha having, I mean, I know all of y'all have gone through this. Um, I think staff's recommendation would be to uh, appoint two members because it's a lot of work that you may not want to do up front during a full board meeting. You still have full knowledge of all applicants and that sort of thing. And the final decision would come here to, come to, the to board. decide between a few applicants or just to basically get the Rubber selection stamp? committee's mm -hmm. recommendation to say yay or nay? Probably uh, I would recommend that the selection committee provide a recommendation to the full board, but also lay out, you know, you would you would have full preview a purview of, of everybody that applied and that sort of thing and, and the reasons why and if there was a close case, then we would explain that too, just lay it out for you. Um, but with a recommendation, always believe in that. How many applicants do you anticipate? Hundreds, if not thousands. No. <laughs> <laughs> How many do we have, Karen? Twelve. Twelve thus far. And it's relatively new in the process, which is great in itself. You know, it our is. community is interested. Uh, 
so an average of four persons per committee. Yeah, and I, I think for the water rates advisory committee, you we had eleven. We had eleven, and um, so you know shows interest from our That's customers. Great. That is great. Well, I, I just went through a similar process mm -hmm. with the GSA. Uh, uh, sorry, the GSP Groundwater yeah. Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee. So, against my better judgment, I will serve on this. <laughs> yeah, that was good. I, and I and I, I would want to be able to talk to people who are on the these committees in case they, you know, if they know the applicants, to get feedback on them. I'll sir, I will be on it too. So you guys both think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're not. We, I don't think we serve together in any committee. Yeah. <laughs> <at all. laughs> No, they have not. So, well, I, I think it'd be good to give the subcommittee the ability to remove names if they're just not applicable. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think yeah. having having them go through and read them and rank them, and they all come back to us, and then right. we have to review them and rank them. And I think that's kind of wasted effort. So, right. Mm -hmm. But I still, if there's a if there's a couple of yes, applicants, yes. I'd I'd still like to be able to review those last. And in fact, I think it'd be good to have you know the top two or three come back to us, and, and then maybe just with your recommendations. Yes, right. and I'm fine with the two volunteers. Sure. <laughs> I have I'll, a oh, I, go ahead. I have a couple of changes to uh, attachment one. Okay, attachment one. The last paragraph of that, the middle sentence says, "If a vacancy occurs, the district may appoint a public member from the active." Dot dot. So I think it's appoint, not appointment. Where? Can you let's see. Oh, yeah. Bottom 119. Uh, right there. That uh, bottom paragraph oh, right there. in the oh. middle. Yes. The district may appointment a public member. Yeah, okay, I'll take care of that chromatic layer. Thank you. <laughs> and on the next page, I had a question. It mentions the chairperson shall be a member of the board, and this chairperson is the one who reports back to the board of the activities. But it doesn't say anything about the requirement for the vice person. So is does that vice person need to be a board member or not? It does mention that, you know, the if the chairperson uh, isn't available, then the vice ch chairperson shall perform the duties of the chairperson, including reporting back to the board. So yeah, it, I'm, I'm not it, sure how that. Maybe Mr. Basso could chime in. But the way it currently is is that they are the 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 two board members or the chair and the vice. It doesn't chair. say that. I understand that. Okay. Um, and it does say that they elect it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, this as it's written, leaves it open. It does. Uh, to it a member probably of would be, should be a board member. Okay. Okay. So, so that should be changed then. Yeah, and we'll change, we'll, all right, based on board input, we'll change that too. Okay. Do we need to bring this policy back since it was already approved by the board in the past? Yeah, or can we take the, these? Aren't we doing it tonight? Modifications and you make that. Take the modification. Okay. Mm -hmm. kind of real, okay. This is just a policy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you for asking, though, Karen. Mm -hmm. Anyone in the public wish to address us on this item? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was ready. Becky Steinbrunner. Um, some people have asked me about this and, and what what's the time commitment and I'm, I'm sure that would vary by the committee that you served on and the issues before the committee but that's a big question people have mm -hmm. that have talked with me and also perhaps the larger question is well how much difference do you think serving on this committee really makes um, what what um, recommendations have come from this the citizen, the ratepayer on these committees that you felt it was important to add another uh, citizen and really what's, what is the effect that someone serving on one of these committees could have? Thank you. What was the amazing thing Larry came up with? Oh, uh, Mr. Freeman alerted us to uh, some grant guidelines Oh yeah. That um, basically already have made a million dollar difference and mm -hmm. have opened the door. The the state board took the suggested modification and um, opened the door to 
yep. many millions more. So it was that in itself. So that, that was a huge one. And then I know in the public outreach committee, I know Adele has been really valuable just with her perspective that it helps everyone make better decisions. Yeah. And I think on the rate committee, I mean, I think th you had some powerhouses there that also really shaped uh, the where y your journey on that. They've so. been very influential, yeah. I mean, I think at least the two that I've been most associated with, stuff comes from staff and we review it and make some changes and it goes on. But the rate committee was, you know, we, we started with nothing. So we basically built a, a rate structure just by mm -hmm. talking about it and thinking about it and reading about it. Yeah, and we're really trying to emulate that model. We, we realized the, the value that came out of that. So uh, try and we've had staff had discussions that eventually evolved more into that, more feedback instead of just uh, presentation and maybe minor tweaks, but getting into the meat of some things too. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a good question, Becky. And I think also the time commitment, I think the meetings are technically about once every other month. And they're hour, an hour. hour long plus. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe an hour or two, depending on. Yeah. Probably a little more since we've expanded the scope of most of these right. committees. Yeah. And then, you know, and the, and the, the other outside is that they are often just a sounding board, but the people who would participate in that would also get a greater understanding of how things are work work in the district too. So it goes both directions. So it's a good oh. way to learn more about how the water system works. So, uh, so staff is looking for a motion to direct them. I'll make a motion that we have a selection committee and that the members be directors Christensen and Jaffe and that they bring back you know, their recommendations but give us the option of a more than just one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I'll second whatever he said. <laughs> Okay, we have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. 6 7, pre presentation on Sky Tim. <coughs> Great. The reason for bringing this to you tonight, um, because it was presented at the March 15th MGA meeting, go full for, is uh, for twofold. One is to uh, give you another chance to look at it. This is uh, highly technical information, but it's distilled down to a very visual, uh, but also uh, not to just uh, inform everybody again, but uh, to obtain feedback uh, about if you want to have another presentation where we might invite uh, other members of the community who would benefit from this. I was thinking the city of Capitola, council members, or, or whoever. So that's this two part. So uh, I am doing the presentation that uh, the gentleman from Denmark gave, Max uh, Healthcare, uh, and also that the hi MGA hydrologist, uh, Cameron Tana, did. So I'll be covering both those, um, and I'm using their uh, some of their same slides. Um, so I just want to make sure that's clear. But before we, I'll, I'll touch on one. This is a slide we created to, to really touch on the problem, just to make sure it's. Uh, evident, especially to anybody who may be watching on the television, is we had this conundrum uh, until recently about where the seawater intrusion really was in the, in the center part of our district. This slide here shows where we detected seawater intrusion in the monitoring wells along the coast. So you can see that orange dot, those two orange dots, they were probably maybe a quarter of the amount of seawater in those, in those wells, and those red dots are halfway to all the way to seawater. So we knew that, but what we didn't know was where is it in between those two dots? So we said, is it, is that the enter button? No. We said, is it there? Or is it there? Or is it there? And we, did, we didn't know, and um, we didn't know there was a way to find that out uh, until we were approached by uh, people from Denmark who said they had the technology to do this. So this board and the MGA board decided to uh, invest in that. It was about a $110,000 effort to find the missing piece of the puzzle and a little bit of a gamble whether it would even work. Uh, it did, though, and so that's what I'm going to present tonight. So if we can go, um, let's go back to the packet. Okay. 
and we will have to come back to that. Um, and then in the packet, we need to go to um, attachment three. So, and let me let me run it from here. Um, so this is the this is the presentation that was presented, and just this is the SkyTim apparatus. So it's a helicopter flying out over the ocean with an elaborate giant metal detector, if you will. I know that's underestimating it, but uh, I think this is good, Shelley. And you see it there a little bit more there with the, the different components. What's key? Because I'm going to I'm going to go through a bunch of maps here to show you what's going on but this is the key to the whole thing it's a very colorful uh the maps are very colorful what what you need to really know is that if it's red it's salt water if it's blue it's fresh water and if it's yellow it's probably brackish water and green is brackish to to regular water so that's the key red is bad blue is good and in between is not so good because even brackish water um is, is bad, you know, the, the state considers uh, 250 milligrams per liter, the MCL, um, for seawater chlorides, and the... Um, and some vegetation won't even stand that. Right, grass, some vegetation won't even stand that, and s full seawater is like s 1,900, so just a little bit of seawater mess you up. 19,000? Yeah, 19,000. Thank 000. you, yeah. Of chloride. Of chloride, yeah. Chloride. So here, you know, this is a familiar map to us, Highway 1 here. This is our coastline, and, and what these r lines in red show are the flight lines of the helicopter. So it did many lines basically parallel to the coast coming out, and then we did some vertical lines, and we're able to even go inland. And where we went inland once or twice, we were able to uh, collaborate that data with monitoring well data, and so there was high correlation. So we feel confident about the the data overall. This has been reviewed by several outside people. So what I'm going to do is show you the same map. I think everybody's oriented here. And we're going to go from down through the Earth. So that 0 to 2 MBSL means 0 to 2 meters. Remember, we're in Denmark time, so to speak, below sea level. And so right now, zero to two meters below sea level, what would you expect to find? Seawater, and that's why it's red. So here we go. I'm just going to pull us down through here. And then we'll, we'll, you'll see it visually, and then I'm going to come back with what's it really mean. So here we go. We're four meters down. And, and just to be clear, that would be like 12 or 13 feet, uh, you know, 3.2 3 meters or feet per meter, right? So we're going down through. You start to see a little bit of yellow there coming in, a little bit more. So you're, you, what we're interpreting that as is, is more brackish, not straight seawater. So you're down 30, 40 feet. Uh, keep going down through the earth here, uh, horizontal layers, if you will. Oh, OK, so down about uh, 60 feet, 70 feet, a little bit of fresh water up here uh, coming out. And then a little bit more. So there we, some fresh water is as noted on the map. This is down about, oh, what, 150 feet roughly. Uh, it's important to note, really, most of our pumping takes place about 300 feet below land surface. We do pump from higher layers, but if you want to get into what where we pull most of our water from. So now you're getting down about you know 230 feet, and and it's start that blue starting to go away, and it's it's going a little bit more way back to brackish down 300 meters below sea. I mean 90 meters below sea level, call that 300 feet, and you already got pure seawater along the coast and brackish water here, uh, uh, right up against the coast. Still, he's calling that uh, fresh water. It might be brackish. And now you see as we go deeper, you're seeing more seawater becoming more saline there. So again, and I think we're, that's, that's, and so as we get down deeper, it turns almost all back to pure seawater, not even brackish. And so uh, I will, okay, so that's going horizontally down through 
the earth. You just layer after layer like pancakes, and you're looking down on them. Now we're going to do, do it a little bit differently. These lines, we're going to look at those, but as cross-section, vertically cross-section. So it's like we took one of those lines and went and looking at it sideways now. And we'll look at this one first right here, this one next, and we'll just go through these maps here. So in that first line, again, to orient you, okay, right here, it, it, oops, you need to see that again? I can come back to this map. Furthest red one. This one right here? Uh, section yep. Okay. Yep. Section 8. Section 8. Yep. We just come on shore. Uh, it's after, a, it, there's a monitoring well there. Yeah, so that looks like, sea cliff. you can see there's, there's fresh water. This would be, um, State Park Drive. Yeah, and the ocean coming in like this, and there's a little bit of fresh lens under there, but at deeper, about 300 feet, you see the, uh, the ocean water. Um, but even that is blue, it's green. 600 right, feet. right. It's 600 feet there. Okay. Um, are, we, are we all the way over the side on this thing? Yeah, let me. Okay, you want to do that? You, you got. Okay, thank you. A little bit bigger. And slide it over. Yeah, there you go. You see. So on the right, you're seeing a monitoring well, and that was another indication. And this next line over, going more toward the east or south, as some people would say, you another cross-sectional view, you, you see it. There, fresh water on land. That's on land there. Those are our monitoring wells. And then you can see basically seawater. That, that transition zone between the blue and the red is, is, is uh, the coastline. So um, you can see saline water goes underneath the land there too. Okay, next cross section, please. And then here's a, another one further toward the aromas, which we already know we have seawater on uh, on land. Um, it's duplicating that. Um, and let's see what else do we have. So this is this is uh, an interesting one. This is looking at the coast as if you were out in a boat, and looking back on the coastline. I think the left side is. Um, I don't know, near Capitola, a little bit to the, to the east or west of Capitola, and the right is all the way to the far right of our district. So now you're looking at a slice, basically right at the coastline down, and you can see that a little bit of blue there to the left, and those monitoring wells are projected onto the map. They're not in the ocean. Um, and so it gives you an idea. It's mostly red with some brackish water and a little blue up top. Um, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, in the sense of water resources. I mean, the other thing is that blue section does not go very far off the coast. Right. So it's it's limited both in its vertical and its horizontal. Yeah. From the yeah. I mean, you'd want to see that plus if you had a healthy offshore flow. Is that Aptos Creek? Uh, that I think that's near there. SCA three. Yeah. Taj, can you speak? Is that near Aptos Creek where that blue comes out? A little bit to the east of it. Right here. There it is. You yeah. can see it right there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That so looks you're like right. Aptos Creek. It says La Silva. Oh, it's La Silva. Wait, oh, oh, no, right. Seascape. SA8. SCA8, yeah. SCA3? Mm -hmm. A3. Oh, that's SCA8. It's 8. Yes, 8. eight so the there's a gulch that goes through there. That's there. So it's in the golf course. Yeah, and and we are talking. I've been communicating with Max, the primary author, on uh, maybe, uh, and of course we take this back to the Mid County Groundwater Agency, but uh, flying this again in about four years. Uh, Marina will probably do it. They did it on inland. We were one of the few. I mean, this is the first time this has been done in the United States offshore. Um, but just an indication of the success that they're having. The governor. State of California signed a $10 million knowledge exchange with them to pay them for um, uh, sharing this kind of stuff with us and helping us. So I know some of y'all have been there and it's, uh, you've seen the amazing stuff they're doing. So next slide, please. So that's Max. He's the one that presented last time. Um, and so that, in a nutshell, is the science. We, that, remember I started with where is it offshore? Well, now we know, those maps show us that uh, it's 
very close to shore, everywhere, in, uh, except right in the middle and the upper top, top for the limited extent. So what does that mean in terms of water resources? Um, now, if you could flip back to the PowerPoint. Um, this is not in the packet. It is in the MGA packet. Um, what is in the packet is uh, the report that this really stemmed from. So I wanted to make sure everybody had uh, all of the reports. So the original SkyTim report is attached to the memo. The presentation I just gave you is in the memo. And the groundwater hydrologist summary of that is in the uh, memo also. This is a presentation they gave on March 15th. It'll, it, it's not in the memo, but will be uh, part of the minutes for the next meeting. So, um, so what um, the take-home message, okay, again, and these maps are very complicated, so I'll just take a minute. Uh, what they tried to do was translate this into um, what it means for groundwater resources. So these are the uh, wells, again, that we have um, seawater intrusion detected in, and the color coding is for the aquifers that they, uh, uh, where the seawater intrusion has been detected. These color lines here represent the uppermost aquifer in which the seawater intrusion was detected. So it was detected all along the coast. Here, this yellow uh, refers back to the aromas. This green color would be another layer in the prisma. Again, and, um, oops. Didn't realize that was so fancy, um, and and so forth around the bay. So what you're s and then the other uh, dots on the map show our water wells, and they're color coded to correspond to which aquifers are tapping. So that's it. So here's the take-home message. Um, and if did you wanted to look at, did you go back? I can. You're going to see that again in just a second. A well, different I, I just want to uh -huh. make sure that. It's clear. So the most landward line shows seawater intrusion. It does. And that's and probably so 500 feet offshore. 500 feet? Uh -huh. Five to 600 feet offshore, I believe. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, it's as close as a helicopter could fly um, uh, to shore. Uh, we're not allowed to fly over people or structures or that sort of thing. So yes, it is, it's about 600 feet offshore, it's the closest line. And so just to give you a cross-sectional view, uh, this is what our aquifers look like. And so you can see the wells tap different aquifers. I won't spend too much time on this one because this is really the take-home message. And maybe you can blow that one up a little bit. So what the hydrologist did was then say, we see how close it is. Um, uh, we know what our protective water levels should be to keep out seawater intrusion. So what's the risk based on uh, 2017 water levels and the proximity of the um, seawater intrusion uh, detected at the coast? And so the bigger the circle, the higher the risk. Those big circles you see there in purple and I think on green uh, down there on the right, correspond to a 50% or greater risk of seawater intrusion at the 2017 levels, those two big ones. So right at Soquel Point, and then uh, right here with Cabrillo being up in here, these are the two really vulnerable spots. And over here is also, and of course, we've already got it intruded over here. So this result, this corresponds to a 30 to 50% risk of seawater intrusion. And this is greater than 50 greater than 50, greater than 50, and this is probably between 20 and 30. You can see the scale just up here, the size of the circle. And again, the colors correspond to what aquifers uh, the seawater intrusion is at and what we're pumping. When you say a 50% risk, what is the, is there a time frame? Or is there, how's that evaluated? It's, you know, that's a great question. I asked Cameron the same question yesterday. I said, I, I need to understand that, and it's, it, they didn't give a exact time frame, that, but uh, it's it's strictly dependent upon the gradient, how fast that seawater intrusion is moving in. Me, the water, depending on the water level here, 
So we're a couple, we're a little bit below um, uh, protective water levels here and here. They could go back and do some calculations, but uh, there's just a high probability that we'll have seawater intrusion sooner than later. Matter of fact, they're, one of their take home messages is not to try to meet the uh, state mandate of sustainability by 2040, but we need to do that earlier, otherwise we will have seawater intruded. They're doing another map or two to show what these circles would look like or the risk based on um, maybe a five-year average water level, uh, protective water levels, or even back in 2014 um, before we did uh, adjustments to our pumping where the engineering department distributed the pumping in an optimal level to reduce seawater intrusion. Uh, they estimated that if it was at the coast and we had that same pumping regime, it would be two years till it hit our main well field here. So that gives you a sense of um, scariness, I guess, if you will. <laughs> um, that's to, about where we have the pumping depression that's right. six feet below sea. Yep, that's, for we, that's where we have the, and then, then uh, we redistributed the pumping, our customers cut back, and we did everything we could to get these water levels up as high as we could here, probably depressing them a little bit more inland, but shifting everything. Uh, so the, the next map that they produce using whatever average, because uh, they use whether it's five year or 2014 or previous, will show lower protective levels and hence bigger circles here indicating bigger risk to the aquifer. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's serious. It's very serious. I would recommend reading the Cameron's report Yes. Because it really talks about the fact that you know, each of our production wells is screened at various intervals. And if you look at where those intervals are and which aquifer it's in, and then you go offshore to see, okay, is there salt water there or is there fresh water there? And it's almost always salt water there. Right. So there is some fresh water offshore, not very far offshore, but it's not where it needs to be to give us fresh water for our wells. Right. Like it's right offshore for the ones that already have seawater intrusion. It's right offshore for the ones that don't have that it. That don't yeah. have it. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, it's basically the uh, one. Uh, probably, I won't say worst case, but uh, it's, it's as close as we can measure it, <laughs> and it's there. Mm -hmm. So here's the conclusions from um, Cameron's uh, slide presentation that he gave. So the. Close proximity of the interface uh, emphasizes the importance of seawater intrusion as a sustainability indicator in the groundwater sustainability plan. So uh, uh, that's, a, that's a given. And uh, reason to recover groundwater levels uh, sooner than 2040 to prevent further seawater intrusion uh, and then model it in the future. Um, but it really points to uh, Two things. One, the great work our customers have done, and we really can't underestimate that, has probably saved us from having seawater intrusion in the middle. And two, uh, uh, we're on the right path, all of us are, for uh, obtaining supplemental water supplies, river transfers, pure water soquel, storm water, all that. Um, you know, this is not a, uh, I think Director Daniels enlightened me a couple of weeks ago. It's not an optimization project. This is a risk mitigation uh, endeavor to prevent uh, these aquifers from being um, uh, ruined. And, you know, I've, I always quote, you know, about 70% of the populated coastal regions of the world that rely on groundwater have seawater intrusion. You don't have to go far to see it. You can go down to Pajaro, it's in three miles, and, and um, Monterey, it's already in eight miles moved a couple hundred feet over the last year because of the, of the pumping inland. But that just, you know, on a global scale it's happening, next door it's happening, in our neighbor, in our water community it's happening, and we have a chance to be one of the few to um, prevent it from ruining the aquifers. So that's, um, and that's, I know that's what we're all about, uh, and this is the data that really kind of supports and that our efforts haven't been in vain to pursue these supplies. Any more board questions? No, I, I, had, 
I had one. I noticed there were references to the the groundwater model that Hydrometrics is mm -hmm. doing and how this data. I, it's there were a couple of rest. There's a lot of information in this uh, report, yeah. but I saw some references to modifying or in having input into the groundwater model to tweak it to make it in to reflect the, the data that were generated by the sky chan right they'll put that in there and director daniels can speak to it more than i can since mm -hmm. he's got a phd in it but the they have they have a groundwater model which now they can take a component of that the seawater intrusion component and put that in here and then simulate pumping and see how fast uh, it'll act and model that those scenarios and more and more you know you can get through just analytical equations how fast it's really moving I think what's more important is how do we maximize or optimize pumping to just try to reduce that or where do you recharge like Orange County's done to best pr prevent it from coming in you know uh, this indicates to me you know you want to be doing as much as possible because once you lose it it's 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 a bad picture it stays that way for a very very long time um, so also what I'm looking for is feedback some of you saw the MGA presentation we would probably start with a little bit about what seawater intrusion is I have, we have a couple slides on that I didn't want to uh, run you through that again uh, tonight but I would probably present those if we invite people it has that uh, slide that shows how seawater uh, comes in when the water levels in the wells drop and a couple other uh, slides so I would I would put those in conjunction with basically what you saw tonight if you <laughs> but I like I like the way you went through the different slides to show the different levels I thought okay. that was good mm -hmm. you know and then showed the longitudinal sections yeah yeah no we need to uh, I mean for a proof of concept study it was it surpassed uh, anybody's expectations right. Uh, uh, in terms of the results, but I think we need to work to make sure we disseminate it to our community, not only the our customers, but the rest of the larger community. Mm -hmm. Who uh, is? I don't think people really know that yet, and they. I don't. If even if they'd gone to the MGA, they might not have really gotten that. It was uh, the sound system wasn't that good. I think this m might be a better venue even to mm -hmm. schedule right. a. Right. Something. First patch so one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The uh, the slices need to have a line on when you're going beneath the seafloor. Yeah, that would be helpful. So anything landward of that line, you're now looking beneath the seafloor, because the initial slices, it's all you're just looking at the seawater, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and then as you go deeper and deeper, what that line of what you're imaging will move away from the coast mm -hmm. and everything from the line to the coast you're now looking under the seafloor and I right. think that that is not intuitive to most people it's not I, what I can't I mean I, what I can do is is basically find out the bathymetry a little bit and say okay all, once we're below 20 feet or you, 30 feet you're, you're all you need to do okay. is basically put contours okay equivalent to the I'll see what I can do. I'm, I, I, uh, I'll see what our, G our, our staff can, how they can. Mm, uh, if you do need that. data, come to me. Okay. Um, there's another important component of this, and are you on the report itself? Yeah. Uh, not. Uh, let's see. It was report attachment one. There, the thing that often it took me a while to catch uh, is that they did a, another type of sensing and what that shows that's what I was trying to get the actual report to pull up one of the diagrams not the presentation he gave what's oh, the one that looks like popcorn one. okay yeah. uh, what's that it kind of looks like popcorn <laughs> yeah yeah it looks like popcorn so yeah this is oh, the oh, go down a little bit let me see something yeah, here. See the yeah. Report. yeah so that's the report so go down about 20 slides 20 pages there's um, other data and what it shows are features offshore and my point is that in the Monterey area, and actually in the other areas like in Florida where they have seawater intrusion, they, they go over, keep going, I'll tell you when to stop, um, preferential pathways. And that case, okay, slow down there. And so you see that a little bit here. I mean, they're mapping the seafloor. You don't see it so much there, but this other data 
also shows um, maybe maybe we did pass it. But anyway, my point is is that you can't think of this as just a, a, a front, if you will. There, it's much more complex than that. And um, I think some of this data right here is showing that the magne magnetic structures. So uh, if it's at the, the coast, it, it could even move faster down a preferential pathway. And a preferential pathway would be like an old riverbed. That's a common one uh, where it's, it, there's gravel, you know, uh, maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 feet down, and it can move faster through that gravel than it can the more sandstone-ish uh, uh, aquifer. And so, there are also the faults out there too. Yeah, and faults are another, it can be a preferential pathway or a barrier. Um, so just, that that's something that Max didn't stress, but um, I think it's important to note, um, because you may not, you may miss it right along a little uh, at a monitoring well, but it could be 60 feet off and, and you know, going down some preferential pathway. So it really speaks to getting a strong uh, barrier against seawater intrusion along the entire coast, I believe, and, and multiple aquifers. Well, it also couldn't it impact the a potential recharge uh, sites too, like the, just the knowledge of, you know, some under, below surface breach that would enable water, would be flowing out at a higher rate and creating a lens outside of the, off the coast? Ye, if I understand, you could, could recharge like from stormwater, go down and then push out and, and push. Yeah, well it would flow out w yeah. without ev really ever addressing the aquifer. If there's a fault line. Yeah, I suppose just about anything along those lines is, is, is possible. I mean, certainly once you go subsurface, um, you know, you can't see down there. You're, you're working kind of on law of averages, so to speak. And yeah. And nature doesn't behave that way. Though we do know that you know, the creeks there have been around for a long time, and they're what's called paleo channels, and those were put into the model. Yeah. I specifically asked for that because I know that that's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Salt water can come in faster, and stuff drains out easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean lower, lower sea level during the ice age. Yeah, 130 meters down. Yeah, the yeah the the. <laughs> The boundary between the coast and the ocean is offshore many miles. Yeah, it's changed over time. That, um, and then that also, I heard somebody mention climate change. You know, if, if ocean level rises, then there's probably more head or force to push in uh, the seawater intrusion too, which I believe the model will account for. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what we see will hurt us and what we don't see will certainly probably hurt us too in this. So that's, a, that's another take home because there's a lot, even though it's revealed that um, you can just see how complicated it is with this map right here. All kinds of things are happening with the uh, magnetic data. So what I hear is defining the uh, sea floor uh, would be a good uh, w best way we can do that. The, um, and then uh, getting this out to the public, maybe at another board meeting, maybe we'll, we'll look into appropriate time to schedule it and try to uh, get as many people as possible um, to who uh, we think it has relevance to and decision making to attend. Okay. All right. <laughs> to the horizontal. Thank you. Thank you. No, no motion on this. Anyone in the public wanted to talk about this? Becky Steinbrunner, thank you for the presentation. I was late arriving to that um, that meeting that night. I did see that uh, community television was there filming. Where is that going to be? I didn't see it on any websites. When will that be up? I believe they're editing it right now. It'll be up on the MGA website, maybe ours. I, I don't know exact time, but a couple weeks, max okay. probably. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have some things that I have questions about. Um, on, on, uh, first of all, I, I was curious to know why uh, Dr. Rosemary Knight's work doesn't really seem to be at all referenced in here. It is in two of the references, but it, it looks to me like it wasn't really incorporated in 
um, the data as a snapshot of what has been there and to be able to compare what we see now with this SkyTem. And I think that's a missed opportunity if, if the two types of data are compatible. Um, and perhaps her data was incorporated into the hydrometrics model. I'm not sure, but I couldn't tell if that was so by reading the document. Um, I also wondered, um, because it says in the survey design that um, when the scope of work is to detect fresh water beneath seawater as well as sediments with saline water, the depth to water is a limiting factor, and it is found that a depth to water can be a maximum of 15 to 20 meters in order to be able to detect fresh water beneath the sea bottom. So I have a couple of questions about that issue. Was this study done at high tide or low tide? And um, did that influence the pathways? And um, did, uh, on page um, 137 in the study, it talks about the, the uh, geological formation and that there needs to be some boring holes done to really establish the geological integrity of some of these areas. And I wonder, uh, as well as faults, which I think was a very interesting discovery. And um, I have a question about, um, on page 134, it said, again, going back to Dr. Knight's work, no other information was used in the model. Um, again, no reference to Dr. Knight's work. Um, Page 130, uh, Ramble has uh, requested additional processing of the initial, initially provided magnetic data. And so I wonder when that would be happening. Thank Can you. I just finish one question? Okay. What action is your board gonna take now that you've got this scenario before you and um, I'm really happy that you did take the prevent the initiative to do the pipe study, and I really think this brings home that we've got to move forward with the North Coast water transfer as soon as possible. I have other questions too, but I'll save them for staff. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make a comment. <laughs> so um, when you have independent uh, approaches to determining the seawater intrusion, as is the case with this study and Rosebury, Dr. Knight's study, um, then you're sh more sure of your results. And so it was by design that this study was done independently. It was, it was, it, we were advised to, to do it that way. And of course, a, a future step is to compare. But if you if you uh, use the data from from another study in this in too soon, then you're not as sure of your results because you don't have the independent the independent estimates. So, just wanted to say that. Okay. Anything else? No. I think it's good work. It was a good investment, it turns out. Yep. Good. And what are we going to do next? Work like the devil to fix the problem. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. In multiple good, ways. Good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I think we're adjourned to a closed session. We're adjourned to a closed session. We're not doing closed session 8.1. We're only doing closed session 8.2. Which was which? No, that. No. It's been continued to August, uh, April 24th. Didn't I? I told you that. Yeah, I think you did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Nice job. I think the snapping me out of it.